itself. We've all been there, haven't we? You're playing a game and you hear yourself say, okay, just this one quest and I'm done. Only this level up and I'll go to bed. All right, this island is so close. Let me just do that and I'll quit. Just three more Rattatas and my Charmander will finally evolve. And before you know it, you hear the blackbird singing in the dead of night. <clears throat> I, I apologize for that. Now, when you think about it, in most cases, the things you do are actually extremely repetitive and daunting. Sailing to the 20th micro island in a row to collect meaningless treasure, fighting the same Weedle for the 300th time, or doing the same boring FedEx quest that you've done dozens of times already. Why do we keep doing this and often completely forget the time over it? Well, because the designers have deliberately trapped us in a Skinner box. A Skinner box is a lab experiment invented by the American behaviorist Skinner. No, not this Skinner. Nope, still cold. This one. Burris Frederick Skinner, which is used to study both respondent and operant conditioning. We've already talked about respondent or Pavlovian conditioning in this episode. Check it out if you haven't seen it. While respondent conditioning simply connects a biological response or emotion to an unconnected external stimulus, like the dog that starts drooling when the bell rings, operant conditioning expands these principles to actively influence and train behavioral patterns in the subject. Basically, it's a chamber with as few external stimuli as possible. A test subject, usually a rat, a pigeon or a primate, is put in the chamber and exposed to at least one manipulandum, such as a lever or a button or a light. Since the button is the only point of interest, the primate will quickly examine and operate it, which will cause food, a reward, to be dispensed. In this constellation, from that point on, the primate will push the button when it's hungry, eat until it's full and wait until it gets hungry again, which is a pretty normal and straightforward behavior. The operant part comes in when further stimuli are introduced that are directly tied to the food dispensing mechanics. For example, an LED that serves as a conditioned reinforcer. Only when the light is on will pushing the button result in food being dispensed. The subject quickly learns this pattern, but in most cases, since the reward is now bound to a time constraint, it will eat significantly more during the feeding periods than it would otherwise. This effect can be strongly increased, for example by prolonging the waiting intervals more and more over time, or by punishing the subject for not feeding when the light is on, for example by electric shocks emitted through the floor. With these methods, the subject's behavior is steered and modified and it often leads to compulsive and unnatural overconsumption of food. Now let's compare this to how a game like Assassin's Creed Black Flag treats the primate, I mean the player. Very early on you will learn that your game's progress is monitored in the Animus memory segments and that you need to finish all missions and collect all treasure and stuff in an area in order to get a bright 100% score for that segment. And the first areas are crafted in a way that it's easy and fast to achieve that perfect score. This feels rewarding. As stupid as this may sound, but our primal gatherer instincts feel gratification by completing things, collecting stuff, filling up progress bars, working through checklists and so on. And this triggers the reward pathways in our brains, which leads to endorphins being distributed. Happiness hormones, so to say. So instinctively, we desire to repeat this success in the future. But just like in the Skinner box, the more you progress, the more effort it takes to achieve 100% in an area. More missions, more treasure, slightly but gradually. But the more areas you have completed, the more you have already invested in that perfect streak. So the urge to not break that chain manipulates you into doing more and more repetitive and objectively daunting tasks. And since the world becomes more open and wide over time, if it's crafted well, or let's say effectively, you will almost at any time find yourself just in reach for something that completes the next section, unlocks the next area or fills up the next progress bar, so that you constantly find yourself thinking, okay, this treasure is so close, I'll just finish that before I quit. And although this is, without question, manipulation, it can, if done right and considerate, make for some very compelling experiences that leave the player with a deep sense of accomplishment. Sadly though, those techniques are more often shamelessly exploited than used for good. 
For example, in a vast majority of free-to-play games, not the few examples of games that use the business model faithfully, but the hundreds and thousands of shovelware casual games that deliver very little actual gameplay, because that's hard and expensive to make, but instead lure the player into a compulsive reward cycle and grab their money with constantly increasing paywalls. And there's a reason why so many people forgot their entire lives, jobs, relationships, family, friends, everything over games like World of Warcraft. And yes, those are extreme examples, but as good as the game might be, you can tell me that the combat mechanics on their own, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is so incredibly good that it makes people sink years of their lives into it. It's a carefully crafted, constant cycle of promised reward and progress, combined with an ever-increasing amount of identification. And like in the Skinner box, the intervals between rewards get gradually increased over time. And in the case of MMORPGs, this factor gets multiplied with social pressure. Because without you, your guild would be missing its tank for the next raid, and you don't want to be that guy. No one wants to be that guy. And here's your punishment, the electrified floor in case you don't hit the button while the light is on. It's your choice, you can either be bus killing or be an important part for the success of your community. As I said, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with these mechanics. They can help carry the player through phases in which the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay isn't that engaging for a while by adding an extrinsic motivation for the player that takes him to the next moment of pure intrinsic awesomeness. And these operant game mechanics can even be applied to real-world problems. Gamification, basically. It's happening a lot and it can lead to great results, increased productivity in schools, workplaces and in our everyday lives. Even I, myself, when I work, use these methods to help me overcome the constant freelance self-motivation dilemma. I separate my workload into chunks of 30 minutes of work. Each day the goal is finishing at least 18 of these chunks. But since a checklist of 18 empty boxes looks very disheartening, I start the day with a sheet of just 4 checkboxes. They are finished quite easily in just about 2 hours and after that I allow myself a treat. Then I switch to the next sheet with 10 checkboxes. But since 4 of them are already completed, I'm starting with 40% of the next level already finished. Which makes it seem a lot easier than 6 empty checkboxes, even though it's the same amount of work. It's stupid, but it's just how our brains work. It's the same basic principle, easy and fast rewards in the beginning to get you going and milestones that get stretched further apart over time. Now if you want an example for a game that is basically nothing but an elaborate Skinner box, play Cookie Clicker. It's a free browser game, here's the link, but be warned, this game is designed to be highly and unforgivingly addictive. Even when you know the principles at work, it still works, you'll see. Try to analyze how the game eases the player into its reward cycle and how it constantly promises new rewards and how it stretches the intervals between rewards over time while still leaving you with the impression that the next achievement is just around the corner. So let me wrap this up like this. Skinner box techniques are like a penis. When you use them with skill and knowledge and in appropriate situations, you can make other people very happy with it but force it abusively on others without their consent and only your own benefit in mind and you can do terrible damage, yeah, even ruin other people's lives with it. So be careful what you do with your Skinner box techniques. So as always, thanks for watching, keep on playing and I'll see you next time on Ragnaroks.